veut dire d'ores et déjà qu'on va avoir très très chaud. C'est ça, une canicule si précoce, si intense, c'est une première en France au mois de juin. Des températures records, 12 à 15 degrés au-dessus des normales de oh, saison. Et oppressive heat rising northwards across the whole of the UK. London, 39 degrees, breaking the July record. C'est toute l'Europe qui suffoque, des records de température ont été battus aux Pays-Bas, en Belgique, en Italie. La Terre vit en ce moment sa période la plus chaude depuis 2000 ans. Alors est-ce le seul fait de l'homme Ce réchauffement est-il irréversible Les... Summer 2019 in Europe illustrated the urgency of the climate crisis, which claimed its first victim, water. The demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. I mean, it is stark. It's stark. In France, nearly two-thirds of all regions are affected by water restrictions. Farmers have seen their crops destroyed, while others try to adapt to climate change. After two record-breaking heat waves... Today, 70% of the Earth's pure water is used for human consumption. It has become the most coveted resource on the planet. To save humanity, Wall Street wants to start a revolution. Make water profitable and create water markets, just like oil markets. Water falls from the sky, therefore it should be free. Whenever I hear that, I always say, diamonds occur in nature and they're not free. It's a financial product, like any other financial product. The market is changing a bit over the last couple of weeks. It's around that 485 to $495 a litre market today. We're just at the beginning of this water financial revolution. What about the guy that can't afford it? That guy still needs water. The blue gold rush has begun. Can anyone stop it? The human right to water means that it's not a charity. It's an issue of justice. This is the issue of our time. This is the crisis of our time. With financial pressure on human mobilization rising, the battle over water has already begun. Who will come out on top? The planet? the people or the markets. London, the financial capital of Europe. Here is where the relationship between water and finance first began 30 years ago. At the time, it was simply a question of commending the virtues of privatization. It was Margaret Thatcher, prime minister at the time, who championed the cause. That even socialist France knows privatized water is a better deal than nationalized water. That the water privatization, I believe, will go very successfully indeed. What happened was the entire system, the entire physical system, as well as the concession, was sold to the private companies. One of the first things some of the companies did was to start cutting off water supply to people who hadn't paid their bills. One company, for example, disconnected 11,000 customers. And as far as the company was concerned, they could stay disconnected. If they didn't pay their bills, they didn't get any water. How many times do you think you'll have to make this journey then during the day? Well, I've just come down again, well, probably another four or five times. I mean, you've got to have something to drink, haven't you? You've got to do some cooking. 
we didn't even have to queue for this during the war time. I said myself, it's disgusting. But from the market perspective, that doesn't matter. The market couldn't care less if people die of cholera. Really, that's not their job. Their job is making money and they've done that very well. Finally, 10 years later, a law is passed that prohibits companies from cutting off the water supply to those who haven't paid their bills. But this is not enough to deter the financiers. On the contrary, in the early 2000s, a new generation of traders enter the world of water, namely private equity funds or vulture funds. They are hungry and completely unaccountable. They may be funds which have a 10-year life and they therefore they need to get their returns over that decade that they will be the owners and then they need to find a new owner. So you have a lot of international investors, people who may never have been to a water plant in Yorkshire at all, or may never have been to Yorkshire. In London, Thames Water, the distribution authority that covers 20% of the country, is bought by the Australian-based Macquarie Funds. I was aware of Macquarie. I mean, they were quite a famous um, institution in Australia where they'd been known as something, I think they were called the Millionaire's Factory because so many people who worked at Macquarie became very rich as a result of the bonuses that they earned. Macquarie were one of the first private equity companies to say these are good places to be. One of the simple reasons for that is... If you observe, there is and is going to be population growth. If there's population growth, there's going to be more water being drunk. David Hall is the man who revealed this water scandal. In 2017, he published a study in which he detailed 30 years of abusive practices, rising bills, soaring dividends to shareholders, and tax evasion. A caricature of financial capitalism. We ended up concluding that about 2.5 billion pounds per year was being taken out of the system by private capital. Now, the main reason for that was that the dividends they were paying themselves were very high and very regular. So these companies were perfect cash machines? They still are. They still are. Everybody believes correctly that we are being swindled by the water companies. The Australian-based Macquarie Funds supplied London with drinking water for 10 years. Their parting gift when they left the market? $56 billion of debt. Somebody at that point will have to repay all those borrowings. Well, there's only one source of money in the whole water industry, and that is the customer. And when the customer has to repay those borrowings, that will affect the charges they have to pay. And, of course, the owners will never return the dividends they've taken out. Those have just gone. I think they take a view that this is a victimless crime. The funny thing about the UK's experience with water privatisation is no one else in the developed world has done it. It's a one-off. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, why is it?
Today, over 80% of Britons would like to go back to a time when water was a common, public, and essentially free resource. But this concept is slipping away. Victorians sweltered through another 24 hours of extreme heat. Overnight, it barely dipped below 30 degrees in many parts of the state with temperatures soaring into the mid to high 40s during the day. Fire conditions, particularly through South Australia, where the mid-north has been rated as catastrophic and the Mount Lofty Ranges have been rated as extreme. Australia, the hottest continent on the planet, on the front line of climate change. Here, drought is a part of everyday life. In this parched country, Australians are getting closer and closer to tomorrow's world. A world where water is a scarce and expensive resource. Bart Dohan is a dairy farmer who lives in New South Wales one of the driest regions in the country. For many months now, his reserves have been empty. The only solution for feeding his animals is to buy extra water on the private market. Come on, girl. Get on. That's the girl. Today, to run just for my cow, it had cost me close to half a million dollars for 12 months of water. $500,000. Can you afford that? It would put a great deal of strain on us if we, if we did it. A great deal of strain. Okay. Like we know a farm in the last three months has already spent one million dollars on water. A storm could come through tomorrow and wipe it all out too. So it's, they've spent the money, but it's still a gamble from whether, whether it's going to work or not. We're trying our best to keep the cows alive. Of course, we can't afford the water to grow crops for the cows. Uh, we can't afford a real lot of grain. They're getting very little or no grain at all at the moment. So they're producing 50% less than what they should be for this time of year. It's just a survival mode. Try and survive, keep our cows going, and um, yeah, try and get out the other end of it. Australia used to be a place of mates and helping each other out, but now it's sort of like dog-eat-dog -dog world at the moment, especially with, with the water policy. Water has become like gold. It is bought and sold with a single click, thanks to mobile phones and an application connected to the market available 24 hours a day. Its price changes daily, depending on supply and demand. It's there, I can touch it, I can paddle my feet in it, but I can't use it. Not unless I've got that, that money. Once the transaction is approved, 
Irrigation channel valves open automatically and pour out millions of litres to customers, those who can pay. People are just taking water from us and it's, it's taking our life, it's taking our food from our table, more or less. Why are we doing it is hopefully next year the rivers are full and that we don't have to go back onto that open market to buy water again. Will it happen? Will it not? We don't know. We might as well play a Russian roulette. To combat water shortages, the Australian government has chosen to ration it. Each year, it allocates a quota to the major water consumers, farmers, industrialists and cities. This is calculated based on activity, existing reserves and weather forecasts. Along with this new law, called the Water Act, water markets have been created where anyone can come and purchase additional rights or sell some of their own. I just want to give you a call as the market is changing a bit over the yeah, last couple of weeks since we last spoke and changed our water down to 520. Yeah. And we're yeah, seeing we're trading we're really happening uh, around that 485 to $495 yeah, a megalitre mark to be parting from water find. Thanks, Pete. Look forward to hearing from you. In just 10 years, the water business has become the new El Dorado with a turnover of $2 billion per year. Morning. Yeah, I am. Nine o'clock, first thing. Yeah. WaterFind is the world's leading water stock exchange. They work with the megalitre, a unit of measurement equivalent to one million litres. Some of my team here call me uh, the water market pioneer. So uh, I'd like to say that I'm a pioneer in the world. Has he got in that order to go then? Well, since I had to do a manual uh, tra the transfer, oh, he, right. he's only got, I think he had yeah, balance of six meters. It, it oh, okay. It was so we'll reset that again then. And, yeah. So prices uh, today are around the $500 per megalitre or per million litres. You've got. Is it expensive? Is, uh, I think it's cheap. What, $500? Um, What's that, 300 euros or 350 euros for one million litres of water? Uh, I'd say that's pretty cheap uh, when you look at it from that uh, perspective. Isn't it a good thing that we are finally putting a value on this resource? Because in putting a value on it, we're going to respect it more. In this new world, every drop counts. Water is no longer a natural resource, but a commodity. In the world of water markets, the key players are the agricultural industry, as is the case with Webster, the country's largest producer of almonds. The directors of this company are among the richest water owners, at the head of a reserve worth more than $200 million. Their almonds are mass cultivated and exported all over the world. In relation to the amount of water used, this is their most profitable crop. On this farm, Brendan Barry has the title of water manager. This is a new area of expertise. That's the wood colony. No, they're not quite ready. But if you grab that. They're big. Yeah, they're bigger, but the taste of them is just a different flavour. 
But the non Perel are the real. Non Perel's. There's other nuts bigger than that, but these are the best seller, that's why. And they crop pretty well, so that's why everyone sort of keeps, yeah, keep them as 50% of the orchard. Yeah. They're easiest to market and whatnot. The total value of our water is, is more valuable than all the land we hold or the plant and equipment or the livestock that we hold. The water market in this area this year has gone from uh, about $320 per megalitre to over $700 per megalitre in, and that's in a period of around five months. Uh, and Double that, the price. Double the price. But that's how it works. <laughs> As water manager, Brendan is more of a trader than a farmer. In our business, we want to use our water efficiently because if we do that, we can drive a greater profit into the business. And that's what we're ultimately here for, is to deliver a profit for the shareholders. These are the things that are interesting or useful. Five, 40, 50, six, 50, 50 I got here, 50 I'll be in, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and 10, and 20, 120 got, you're up, you know, 120 got, and 80, and 300, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 400, 20, 40. Please get out and see it. 15,500 in the corner. 15,500. Anyone else? In five. One out behind. 100 behind. It's five. Yeah. 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 The water crisis and soaring prices have forced David Owen into bankruptcy. He has had to sell the family dairy farm and now joins the long list of victims of the water markets. It's an end of an era. I've been in this district all my life, so I haven't lived more than 10 kilometres from where I sit. So, yeah, it's a special day. Yeah. You look at your um, cash flows for the last 12 months and four years ago, and you realise you're spending more and more on water, and then Jenny said to me, um, you can't keep going on like this. So that conversation wasn't very nice. So I uh, threw my dishes in the, in the sink and stomped out. Yeah, so that was very emotional. Yeah, uh, it's a bit like, it's probably not as much emotion as later on when we were selling cows. I can tell you who her mother is and who her grandmother and great grandmother. In fact, uh, so they tell me you get over it. I hope so. Yeah. Pretty handy to have a spare. I know when they break down. 500. 50. 50. 50 start, you know, yes. Initially, the creation of water markets was welcomed by farmers. Big agricultural players saw it as an effective way to buy water, whilst others plan to supplement their income by selling their surplus. But 10 years later, the market had become ruthless. There's lots of people that don't understand the water market. I don't understand the water market. Just 
unless you keep on to it all the time, you just don't know what's happening. And I don't think a lot of us know what's happening in the water market. Unless you're buying, you don't want to look at the water market because lots of times it only depresses you. <laughs> Especially if you're looking for water and you think, oh, oh, it'll go down, it'll go down. No, it doesn't. It keeps going up. South Australia is on extreme alert as searing temperatures put emergency crews on notice and authorities ready to answer any major crisis. Records fell today and more are set to tumble tomorrow, with Adelaide forecast to hit 45 degrees, nudging the hottest day on record for the city. The CFS warns it won't be able to control any major... Adelaide in south-east Australia, the driest city on the driest continent on the planet. Adelaide serves as a think tank. It's here at the university that the idea of water trading was conceived. And in some years, you might get zero water. So they said nobody could take any more water, so you're going to have to find a way to share water. Mike Young is the founding father of the Australian water markets. A renowned economist, he attended Harvard University and has advised the United Nations. This is the man writing the new history of water. Water scarcity is really there. So water scarcity is part of the future of the world. The global predictions are that by 2050, more than half the world will be living with limited water resources and abundance is a thing of the past. Water needs to be managed in a very precious way. in a way that drives innovation, that makes sure our water goes to the best use as it possibly can. So we make money and feed ourselves well. And that led to the interest in water markets and drove a revolution. The revolution started by Mike Young has turned climate change into a market force. It's fascinating to see how sophisticated our water markets have become. If there's rain forecast in a week's time, the price of water will go down because farmers know they won't have to irrigate. If it's going to be really hot for the next fortnight, then the price of water goes up. Mike Young has opened up water markets to all, farmers, small savers, and above all, professional investors. Nowadays, everybody can buy water on the stock market for consumption or simply for speculation. When water becomes scarce, and as it becomes scarcer, then somebody has to stop using it. And what markets do is they discover and reveal the most appropriate people to pull out of agriculture. As it is for making cars, as it is for lots of things, we live in a competitive world. The new Lords of Water live in the city of Melbourne, the business capital. They are bankers, insurers, pension and investment fund managers. And they are gradually taking control of this blue gold. I don't need to own land. You know, would I like own land? Would I consider it? Yes, but I'm not a farmer. I'm an investment banker. How much did you invest? Uh, not much, maybe $20 million. The price of water has doubled, but in the next 10 years it will double again because of intensive agriculture. 
Nicknamed the Water Bandit, David Williams rules over his empire from high up on the 45th floor. As an owner of expansive water reserves, he rents his water to farmers, as others would rent land. And the future is looking bright. If we go to 9 billion population and the Chinese want more food and the Indonesians want more food and the Indians want more food and they can afford to pay for it, then we need to find more intensive ways of growing food. That means more water. And that's going to lead you smack bang into how you get that water, how you price it, how you allocate it and how you regulate it. With it being investors buying water, it's getting back to the old days of the landlords and the peasant farmers. And if we want to survive or stay into it, we're going to have to buy the water at what the landlords deem the water is worth. Back to the Middle Ages, yeah. Water was the last remaining natural resource to have escaped trading. But Australia has just blown the final whistle. The time has come for maximum profitability and the creation of wealth. I'm a Narinri elder. I speak on behalf of my people, on behalf of this land and this water. Water, for me and my people, is a part of who we are. It's a part of our stories, our creation stories. Today is different. Australia has uh, implemented water markets. Yeah. How do you look at that? We don't like it very much. We don't like it at all. Well, we'll see. We have to paint up everyone else first. OK? That's the timeline from my paint today. Selling, trading, what does it? Filling your dams up, making sure that you've got your share, making sure that no one else takes yours. Part of it is madness, and most of it is greed. Greedy people. They want the water, but they also want that. And they'll sell it to somebody else for money. You can't eat money. You can't drink money. Kangaroo. Pinyling, open, 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 pinyling, open, open. Pinyling, yarn, yarn, yarn. Pinyling, open, 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 pinyling, open, open. If you thought the hot weather was bad this weekend, just wait until tomorrow. The fifth day of our heat wave is expected to be incredibly uncomfortable and potentially dangerous as the humidity... Very, very hot today. It's moving in from the Midwest where they've been dealing with this sweltering heat. And now that it's moving here to the East Coast, it could stick around for several days, becoming a full-blown... Make water a commodity. Listed on the stock exchange. Bet on its price. And if Wall Street replicates the Australian model. In June 2008, 
the investment bank Goldman Sachs starts to wonder. Is water the new oil? The firm invites its top clients to take a bet on the future. Goldman Sachs, the conference, that was me. I used to work at Goldman Sachs and in 2008. That was a conference that I held. There's this absolute intuitive appeal that says population growth is outstripping the water supply. That must mean companies that are engaged in the water business are a sure thing that they can't miss. They get mesmerized by these mega trend appeals in water. Is water the next oil? That question's not going to go away. We're just probably not ready for it yet. Goldman Sachs and its investors must wait. Public opinion is not ready yet. It's not until 2015 and the International Climate Change Conference in Paris that the world leaders finally declare a state of emergency. If we act here, if we act now, if we place our own short-term interests behind the air that our young people will breathe and the food that they will eat and the water that they will drink and the hopes and dreams that sustain their lives, then we won't be too late for them. In the developed world for the last hundred years, we haven't had to think about our water or worry about our water. It's been essentially unlimited wherever we want it, whenever we want it. It's been really inexpensive. No one thinks about their water bill. They don't say, oh, take a shorter shower. The water's too expensive. I think that era is over. Climate change is going to have a huge impact on water availability around the world. The same amount of water is going to be available in the big picture, but we don't live in the big picture. We live in a specific place. We raise our food in a specific place. And so the movement of that water will have a dramatic impact on how cities manage their water and how we're able to grow food to feed everybody. The climate emergency demands radical changes. Wall Street re-embarks on its mission. Citigroup, one of the largest US banks, publishes a report announcing the end of free water. There is no alternative to pricing water properly and making people realize that every time they take a sip of water, there is an opportunity cost, and they feel it in their wallet. How else are you going to get people to use less if you give it to them for free? The dam has broken. The soft sounds of liberalism grow louder to celebrate the union of finance and water. We are going to see asset markets selling water derivatives. Even the high-frequency traders, the hedge funds, would become interested. So no, everybody sees this as an opportunity that will come. The question is just when and who will push it first and hardest. And what would be their motivation in, in coming? Profits. Well, also, uh, you know, uh, indirectly doing good for humanity. So it's the best of all possible worlds. What could be better? It's very immoral to trade water. Why would it be immoral to trade water? Because water is life. We pay for health care. Just because it's life doesn't mean it cannot be priced. The last stage in the financialization of water. The launch of a stock market index to bet on water prices by NASDAQ. 
a stock exchange specializing in technology. This is the first time that water has been reduced to an algorithm. works in central London. As a former trader in a Swiss bank, he launched the carbon markets, where industrialists trade rights to pollute in the form of credits, before he discovered water. Water used to be free in the old world, but the world is changing. There's too much stress on the system, and the most important commodity on Earth can't be free forever. If you wanted to put it into the greed scenario, if you don't control it and use it properly, what will theoretically happen is those with the cash will have it and those without the cash won't have it. Lance Coogan is the sort of man who looks to the future. In order to attract investors, he's joined forces with the top water expert in the United States. Look like they're green. A cowboy living in Idaho, in the western United States. The only man who knows the secrets of a market that was, until now, reserved for experts and insiders. Clay Landry runs a company that has recorded every water transaction since the year 2000. It isn't a reliable index. To be clear, you're not buying water, you're buying the price of water. Stuff. So you're not taking physical delivery of the water. So it's only a bet on the future? It market. is a bet. Yeah, it is a bet. We're just betting whether the price is going to be high or low in six months from now. Some might say that this is speculation on water price. Is it a speculation? I think we all are managing on what we think the future is going to look like. If what people are saying is coming, you better be on top of your water situation or you're going to be without water. And what I'm doing is getting people's focus through financial instruments to see what is actually going on on the ground. It changes the world, the world of water. Is it too late to stop a financial takeover bid on water? We are just at the beginning of this water revolution, the water financial revolution. You can't let the market be the only decider of how water is allocated. Price can't be the only way you distribute water because then you'll have rich people with big swimming pools and poor people who are dead. Allt mer tryckande grepp och SMH går nu ut och höjer varningen för varma temperaturer från klass 1 till klass 2 och det här är alltså den näst högsta varningsklassen. Det innebär att det råder extrem värme. Varningen den gäller för de flesta kommuner i Stockholms län och flera... The global water rush is accelerating. Privatization, competition, profit. Key words of the liberal doctrine. Faced with this threat, one woman is standing up. Maud Barlow, a Canadian human rights activist. She has already won her first victory at the United Nations in 2010 when the General Assembly voted in favor of a resolution that recognized access to water as a universal right. It must be declared a public resource that belongs equally to I was in the United Nations, up in the balcony, the day that 
that they voted and I thought we were going to lose. I had staff with me. They were crying. We, I said, don't worry. We're going to be back in two years or five years. No matter how long it takes, we're going to be back and we'll do it. And when they vote, they vote, they sit in their chairs and they vote electronically. So, you know, right away. So boom, 122 countries voted in favor and 41, they abstained. They didn't have the nerve to oppose, even though they actually wanted to oppose. Among the nations that abstained that day were Australia, the United States, and Great Britain, countries that have all chosen to turn water into a financial product. The human family took an evolutionary step forward at that point, and since then, every country has ratified. It's in one way or another, it's, it's now universal. So you got it now. You got it now. <laughs> Maud Barlow may have won the battle, but she hasn't yet won the war. In Stockholm in December 2018, the activist was invited by the Nobel Committee to continue her fight at a conference about the future of water. The United Nations calls water scarcity the scourge of the earth. To truly guarantee the human right to water, we must protect it as a public trust and a commons not a commodity to be put on the open market for sale like oil and gas. And we must challenge the current power structures and institutions that support unequal access to the planet's dwindling water supplies. Our goal must be clean, affordable, accessible, public water for all, for everywhere, for all time. Is it the end of cheap and free water? Well, the corporations and Citigroup and others want it to be the end of free and cheap water. That's their argument. They're saying, oh, yes, it's a human right, because they can't fight that anymore, because everybody says you're an awful person if you, if you deny it, right? So, oh, yes, it's a human right, but the end of free and cheap water. When they say it's got to be a commodity, it's because they know that the scarcer it becomes in a world where you desperately need water, there's, there's gold. It's gold. It's blue gold. In Stockholm, Maud Barlow appears as the grain of sand capable of bringing the water market machinery to a halt. There are an awful lot of people in elite circles, and let's face it, the Nobel's pretty elite, that believe that the best thing to do for wa the water crisis is commodify it, put it on the open market like oil and gas and see what see where it goes from there, right? So I, I, for me, it represented a breakthrough in, our, in getting our message out that we have to see water as a human right, as a public trust and something that belongs to everyone. That's our goal. It's a big goal and uh, not one everyone shares, I have to tell you. Thank you so much for coming. Really, really, it was wonderful. Be activists now. Yeah. Just go out and, and sometimes it'll be hard because sometimes you'll find nobody else. It's like, why me? Why don't, why don't other people care? And it's just the way it is. And you guys will do it. I know you will. You'll be our leaders. The winds of revolt are strengthening. In Europe, the fight against the financialization of water is fueled by the refusal to accept any sort of privatization. And in the streets of Dublin, Rome, Berlin and Paris, citizens are spearheading the resistance. Une vague de chaleur sur toute la France aujourd'hui, jusqu'à 42 à Paris, record battu. Il fait vraiment très chaud et ce la nuit, hein, difficile de faire baisser la température. Des In the French capital, politicians have also taken up the fight. In 2009, the city council ousted Veolia and Suez, the two giants who shared the water market, and created its own water management company, Eau de Paris. Honnêtement, quand j'ai porté la bataille de la gestion publique de l'eau à Paris, mais personne, mais quand je dis personne, personne ne pensait que j'allais réussir. Voilà. Et quand je dis personne, c'est vraiment personne. Pour avoir vu de l'intérieur pendant près de 14 ans le service de l'eau parisien, je suis assez formelle sur le fait que si on veut exploiter la ressource selon des, les intérêts 
du concitoyen consommateur selon la, les intérêts de la ressource sur le long terme, préservation qualité, c'est incompatible avec une logique euh, privée. Parce que la logique du privé, c'est une logique qui sera de rentabilité de court terme. Avant, il y avait quand même au moins un peu une logique industrielle. Maintenant, il y a une logique industrielle, mais qui s'efface de plus en plus devant une logique financière. L'eau est encore du domaine, on va dire, de l'environnement. Mais on voit bien que les acteurs économiques font pression à différents niveaux, les grands acteurs privés, pour que l'eau devienne une ressource économique comme une autre. Le risque est à la fois plus grand et en même temps, il y a une mobilisation plus forte du public. Donc c'est ça qui est intéressant, c'est que je pense qu'il n'y a jamais eu autant de mobilisation autour de l'eau. How long will the European fortress be able to withstand the financial market pressure? In 2012, a petition called Right to Water amassed nearly 2 million signatures, a first for Europe. Protesters demanded that water be given special status. The European Citizens Initiative really changed the way we discuss about water in Europe. It helped creating a movement and a whole uh, idea that water should be considered as a human right. Before, all the documents from the European Commission were starting to introduce market mechanisms, they were always pushing for a liberalization. Now, this is not something that you can easily do. Uh, in a public way. So the official answer from the European Commission was, of course, we support the human right to water, but nothing happened, no, in real, in legislation. The right to water petition has so far halted the ambitions of financiers around Europe. But it remains a fragile victory. There are two paths, and I don't know who's going to win this. It's either water is a commodity, and it's going to be put on the open market for sale, or it's not. It's going to be understood to be a human right. You can't have it both ways. It's time to choose now which path. A word on hope from each of you, please. Well, for me, the hope is the right. I totally get the morality, but the world's a different place, and it's changing, and it's changing fast. Water scarcity and climate change, is it a windfall for our business? Yes, it is. Is that a bad thing? Well, I suppose time will tell. Oh, I'd be saying don't do it. Don't take on this model. People just trying to make huge amount of money out of it. You're more left going to have to sell your soul to get the water to be able to survive. Today, the fate of water is still undecided. Originally, over four billion years ago, water arrived on this Earth from space and has since survived all manner of catastrophes. But it is now being threatened by the men who dream of turning rivers into gold. As if nature was nothing but a giant supermarket. <laughs> 